song asks, how many times? Yes. I turned 39 last week, and I've learned something in my short years of life. I've learned that God isn't the God of a second chance, because if that were true, he'd only show up twice. He's the God of another chance. Can you all stand with me as we read the word of God and turn to the gospel of Mark? Turn to the gospel of Mark. We'll read together chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Mark chapter 8. We'll read together verses 22 to 25. If you have it, say, I got it. it. If you don't, say, wait on me. second book of the New Testament. Mark chapter 8. We'll read together verses 22 to 25. If you don't have it, it's also on the screen. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. The Bible says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village, When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. Bow your heads with me as we consider for our time together. That's what friends are for. That's what friends are for. Father in heaven, our testimony uh, isn't like Samuel where we dwelled in the house of the Lord from our birth up until our old age. We're more like David. Uh, We came, we left, we came, we left, we came, we stumbled, did some things, left, came back, and did the same things over and over again. But you still call us your friends. We ask that you wouldn't give us a second chance this afternoon, but you would give us another chance. In your name we do pray. Amen. You can be seated. In Mark chapter 7 and 8, we see an interesting view of Jesus. We see a confident Jesus. We see a confident Jesus in Mark chapter 7 and Mark chapter 8, and he's meeting insecure religious people. He's meeting insecure religious people who have problems with eating. He's meeting insecure religious people who have problems with food. They put other people down based on what they eat and how they eat and when they eat. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus and his disciples are questioned about proper hand washing. They interrogate Jesus and give his disciples the third degree, not about washing hands with soap or water for 23 seconds or using disinfected hand sanitizer, that's alcohol-based, but they're wondering if the disciples washed their hands according to tradition. And Jesus puts them on blast. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Have you ever met people who honor God with their lips? They honor God with what they eat and how they eat and where they eat and what time they eat. And they make sure you know what they eat how they eat and what time they eat, you know because they're always letting you know on their Instagram story about how healthy they are and how you should be just like them. They honor God with their lips. But they're some of the most unhappy and judgmental people. I had to quit a vegan and vegetarian group this week because they said I wasn't vegetarian enough because I wore leather shoes and I wore leather belts. They said, it's a lifestyle, and if you can't commit to the lifestyle, you can't be with us. Uh, You can't roll with us. These are the people, um, not y'all, but the church down the street, not the church across the way, but the church down the street. uh, They tell you you what you should have in your refrigerator, and they'll come to your house and help you clean out your refrigerator and put in the fake meat. But when you need a real friend, they're nowhere to be found. They honor God with their lips, but their hearts. But Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, it's not about what you eat. It's about what's in your heart. Jesus goes beyond diet and exercise and nutrition, and he meets people at the point of their need. 
if you have issues with faith, if you have issues with hearing or speaking, Jesus does all things well. He cares more about your heart than your cholesterol level. He cares more about what's in your spirit than what's in your kitchen. Before we get to our story, we understand that there's three kinds of people in the Gospel of Mark. And three kinds of people in your life. There's the kind of people, they put you in difficult time. Um, they leave you in your difficult time. And they help you in your difficult time. You have some people in your life, they don't want to be your friend, but they, they follow you and they stalk you and they, they keep tabs on you. They don't contribute anything to your well-being, but your, their connection to you benefits them. They use you as a reference. They, they drop your name. They want you to co-sign for something. They come to your house. They borrow your stuff. They're not friends. They're what my older sister Audrey called frenemies. She says they smile in your place. They smile in your face. Some of y'all ain't been saved your whole life. You know what it is. They want to be connected to you and associated with you. They want to be around you because it benefits them. But a real friend won't put you in a difficult spot. They won't leave you when you're in a difficult place. But they will help you when times get tight. They won't hurt you or hinder you. But they will help you. Mark chapter 7 and 8. Jesus feeds thousands of people. He feeds people. They don't have problems with diet and eating. Check it out. It ain't that deep. They have problems with hunger. Jesus feeds 4,000 people, not with veggie links and soy milk, but with processed meat and with stale bread. Jesus doesn't give people what they don't have. He takes what they do have and he makes it better. Amen. He says, you may not have organic salads with walnuts and, and green beans and you don't eat avocados every day, but you got some fish. Bring me your fish. You don't have the 12 grain flaxseed oatmeal wheat bread, but you have some stale bread. Come here and give me what you have. So many people have goals in their life and they fail to realize that Jesus doesn't come and blow up your spot and cause you to empty your closet and empty your freezer and empty your apartment. He says, what do you have? What are you working with? That's what a real friend does. Instead of looking at your faults and telling you what you should do, they help you take inventory of what you can do. Before you start demolition on, on Fixer Upper, you have to go around the house and see the things that you can keep. What are you working with? Real friends don't criticize you, but they stand in the mirror with you and help you see the best in yourself. Verse 22 of our scripture reading this morning says... A group of people come to Bethsaida and the people bring a blind man and beg Jesus to touch him. After Jesus feeds 4,000, he is headed for the Mount of Transfiguration. In, in Mark chapter 7 and 8, you have mountains and you have miracles. You have famine and you have feasts. You have contradictions and you have celebration. In the middle of it all, you have a man. A man who is blind. A man who is defined by what he cannot do. A man who is defined by his disability. He is defined by his neediness. He has never seen the morning sun. He has never witnessed a mountain vista. He has never seen a motion picture. He is dependent on other people to bring him to Jesus and to beg Jesus on his behalf. Before we know his name, we know what's wrong with him. Before we know what he can do, we automatically know what he can't do. The Bible says they bring him to Jesus and beg for him. I know some people like this blind man. They're, they're so beaten by life when you talk about being a bestie and having a ride or die person. They, they've never had something like that in their life. You talk about self-improvement and going to the next level and they say it can't be done for them because they've never done it. I can't see the sunrise because I'm blind. I can't do well in school because my mother never passed the third grade. They're always saying what they can't do instead of what they can do. 
They're so defeated by life. Check it out. They don't have a fear of failure. They have a fear of success. They can't sing the famous words like Kurt Franklin. He says, I like me. Yo, you like me? Because I like me because God likes me. He likes me, so I like me. Why don't you like me? They look at themselves and they see nothing worth liking. And what starts with so much promise becomes one more thing for me not to like about myself. They become stuck. And they become couch potatoes. Um, you have at least one friend who's been a couch potato at one point in his or her life. That one friend who says they need a place to hang low. They need a place to crash. Um, maybe it's Christmas break or they're, they're between jobs. They don't want a bed to sleep in or a bed to rest in, but a couch to sit on. And everything they do, they do it on that couch. Excuse me, your couch. And their life becomes restricted to that couch. Um, they read on the couch. They sit on the couch. They watch TV on the couch. They play on your computer using your internet on your couch. And they even start eating on your couch. Next thing you know, they have their feet on your couch. And God help you if you come in the house with your shoes on. And food that you cook and prepare for them, they're eating it on your couch and it gets stuck between your cushions. All of a sudden, the room begins to get darker and the clothes get on the floor and their lives become so small and the couch goes from a resting place to a stopping place. That's what happened to Abram in the book of Genesis in, in chapter um, 11, verse 31. It says, Terah takes his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and they together set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. And the Bible says when they come to Haran, they settled there. And verse 32 is one of the most depressing in all of scripture. It says Terah lived 205 years and they never made it to Canaan, but he died in Haran. Do you know some people who's connected to you? They've stopped living. And what was supposed to be a setback, not just became a step back, but it became a step down. Don't become a couch potato. This blind man had come to the point in his life where he said, like Eminem, I've got to clean out my closet. There's got to be something more to this life. You need some friends in your life. They don't define you by what's wrong with you. But they remind you that your condition is not your conclusion. They remind you that you may have began some way on Monday. But your Friday does not have to be that way. Whatever you have in your life, it does not have you. A real friend is somebody who knows everything about you. But they don't treat you any differently based off of what they know. The man is blind, but his crew does not treat him any differently. The man's friends bring him to Jesus, and they beg Jesus to touch him. Why are they asking Jesus to touch him? You see, there are some places in your life, um, you won't get there unless somebody refers you. You have a problem, you have a predicament, you have an issue. Uh, but the only way you'll reach your destiny and your promise is if one of your friends refer you. They hook you up with somebody who doesn't know you, but because you know them, they'll hook you up. You see, I have some ride or die people in my life. I, I can have some sister soldiers, but every now and again, I need some people. They won't just improve me. They won't just help me go to another level, but they will take me to Jesus and plead on my behalf. You need to understand some friends will listen to you and cry with you and study with you and graduate with you and they'll shop with you. 
They will lift weights with you. But you need some friends who will intercede for you. You need some people in your life who will pray for you. They will refer you to Jesus and they will plead for you. You see, this man's friends, his crew, they know that Jesus is a construction worker. They know that Jesus will put on a hard hat and they will touch this man's life who's been nothing but darkness. You need some people in your life, they will ask Jesus on your behalf. They will ask Jesus to touch you the way he touched the woman with the fever, the way he touched the man who had leprosy, the way he touched the bleeding woman and the deaf and the mute man. Jesus, if you can touch my friend the way you touch them, his life can be different. He doesn't know about you, but because he's connected to me, I'm asking you to hook him up. And if I can get you to him, then maybe his life can be better. Um, Jesus, he's better in your hands than in mine. Amen. You see, that's one of the real functions of a friend. They accept you as you are and not as you should be. But at the same time, they will carry you to Jesus and plead for you. Can you pray for me? Because judging me is not helping me to grow. I see the wrong that I've done and I already know. Will you love me if I'm dirty and when I've lost my way till the blood washed me white and I'm no longer gray? I don't need your approval. Will you let me stay and pray for me? I already know that I'm blind, but will you take me to Jesus and plead on my behalf? I need a friend who will remind me that if Dr. Jesus can touch people with leprosy, with fevers, with bleeding issues and ear issues and mouth issues, surely, surely he can touch me because I have eye issues. If Dr. Jesus can master immunology and dermatology and hepatology and thanatology and audiology, surely he can master ophthalmology. Verse 23 says, they take him to Jesus and they beg Jesus on his behalf. Then Jesus does something that messed me up, y'all. Um, he takes the blind man by the hand, takes him outside of the village, spits on his eyes, then puts his hands on him, and have the nerve to ask him, do you see anything? You see, there's a place in your life where Jesus will separate you from your friends and he will deal with you one on one. You see, you need to understand we need people. You know, there, there's people who say, I don't need no friends. It's me and God. We need human beings. We, we see ourselves through other people's eyes. Our personality and our, our identity is formed not in isolation, but in relationship to other human beings. We need other people to grow and to develop. But God does not deal with us in groups. We might come to God together, but God deals with us individually. I can be your friend. I can be your encourager. I can be your study buddy, but only God can be your savior. Amen. David says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. You see, I can pray for you and I can help you with some money and I can intercede for you, but I am not your savior. I can plead with you in the, in, in the presence of God, but I cannot bring God's destiny to you. I can claim God's promises for you, but I cannot fulfill God's promises in you. I can tell you what God has done for me, but you will have to deal with Jesus for yourself. And to do that, sometimes Jesus has to take you away. Away from your friends. So he can deal with you one on one. As the church saints used to sing back home, what a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. 
Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I know you knew school and you like Ty Tribbett and Tasha Cobbs and Anthony Brown, but every now and again, you have to get with Jesus by yourself, by yourself and sing, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. You see, the way you be a best friend with somebody, you seek God together. But when you seek God in private, you become a better friend. You see, if you have friends who are only friends with you in public and they don't lead you to seek God in private, You see, it's great to be with your friends, with your crew, with your entourage, praising God with holy hands on, at concerts and in churches. But Jesus has to take you aside and deal with you one on one. Because he's going to spit in your eyes and put his hands on you. And he got some questions for you and your friends can't answer those. You see, your friends don't always understand what God is doing in your life. Because God is not going to heal you. God is not going to help you the way he helped them. Your story is not their story. Your journey is not their journey. He has to take you aside and deal with you. Um, watch out for the people who want you to come to their house, to, to their meeting, to their chat group, to their retreat. Under the guise of friendship, they're doing it to create codependency. Instead of seeking God every time you're in a tight spot, they train you to come to them for advice. And what they do is they create you in their image. One of the first things I did when I got to Oakwood, I was looking for mentors. And y'all, these mentors almost led me in a cult, y'all, because I was looking to them instead of seeking God. One of the freshman students came up to me, it was about 12 years ago. He said, Joe, do you have any disciples? I said, brother, I don't want you emulating me. I don't want to be your example. I can help you with some stuff, but you need to go to God for yourself. God is going to heal you, but he's not going to do it the way he healed your friend and your sister and your uncle and your mother and your grandfather. The way God is going to help you, it's not going to be in the way you ask, and it's not going to be in the place that you ask it. Your friends won't be able to understand what God is doing in your life. Jesus spits on the man's eyes. And put his hands on him. I don't know about y'all, but I, I would have I jabbed Jesus. He spit in my face and he stepped into me. When somebody in boxing, when somebody is rushing you, 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 do, you do these um, uppercuts to get them off you. I would have jabbed Jesus and knocked him out with a... Anyway. What God is doing in your life, your friends won't understand. He asked the man, do you see anything? Verse 24 says, he looks up and he says, I see men and they look like trees walking around. Um, he says, I see people, but they look like trees. Um, in other words, he says, I can't see clearly, but at least I can see. As we used to say back home, um, I'm not what I want to be. But at least I'm not what I used to be. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, please be patient with me. God isn't through with me yet. Amen. You see, we might be friends. We might be connected. We're not in competition with each other. But we're in collaboration and cooperation with each other. We're in collaboration if we're doing it together. And we're in cooperation if we're helping each other doing what we're trying to do. One of my friends texted me a couple weeks ago. Uh, he said, I walked 31 miles. And I thought the brother said 3.1 miles. 
That's, that's what I thought he meant. So I walked around my subdivision. It was about five times, and I said, I guess we're even. Texted him back. I walked 3.1 miles after working eight hours, after driving 100 miles. I've walked 3.1 miles. He said, um, I didn't walk 3.1 miles. I walked 31 miles. So I made my goal that week to do five miles. Because I, I ain't trying to double up and do what he was doing. I, I can't walk no 30 miles. No. I said, I'm going to do 500 push-ups, 500 seconds worth of planks, 500 curls, and 500 tricep extensions. That's these. And um, after driving 100 miles every day last week and working um, 8 to 10 hour days, I came home every day, and I got the 5 miles last week, y'all. But I didn't do, I only did 100 push-ups, I only did 100 seconds worth of planks, and I only did about 100 bicep curls and tricep extensions. That's when the Holy Spirit slapped me across the face and said, Negro, you're not in competition with anybody. You are on your own journey and you need to celebrate what you've done and where you are. You see, it's possible that when you see people you admire, the same people that you envy, they're actually insecure, and they actually need your testimony to keep going. You're looking at their clothes and their car and their house and their family, but you don't know the sacrifice it takes to put all of that stuff on Instagram. Look at what God is doing in your life and celebrate where he brought you. The man says, I see people, but they look like trees. What are you saying, preacher? Uh, when God is dealing with you, celebrate your progress. Who cares about what anybody else says? So when you start exercising, praise God for six push-ups. When you make health habits, check it out. Praise God for being able to drink one glass of water without putting any Kool-Aid in it. Put the graduation gown in your closet after you pass the first class. Break a bottle of sparkling grape juice when you're on the elliptical and bike for four minutes. Why should I celebrate men looking like trees, preacher? Well, at least I can see men who look like trees. I'm not blind anymore. I may not have 20-20 vision, but at least I can give God a hallelujah praise for my nearsightedness. You're not at your destination, but you're farther along than those who've never started. Because there's some other blind people back where you live. They need to see and hear your testimony. You can't see clearly, but at least you can see. You see, um, I failed out of college a couple times. Um, I didn't even know a GPA can go up to 5.2. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I was in high school, I was striving for a 2.7 um, college. I had a 1.77. I didn't know there was a five point something. And when I failed out of college the first time and, and the second time, um, I didn't have any confidence. My, 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 their, my, my, my people, the people I started high, the people I started college with, they were graduating and I lied and I told them I transferred schools. And while they were walking and saying I'm getting married and I'm buying a house and I'm going to graduate school, I still was in freshman composition. I still was in math 100 and history 100. I couldn't handle the 200 level classes and the 300 level classes, but I tell you, when I got an A in algebra, I believed I could finish the PhD. Confidence comes when you stack successes on top of each other. If you can learn one thing, you can learn two things. If you can learn two things, you can learn ten things. Celebrate the direction you're going, not at the speed you're going there. And don't judge me because I'm not what you think I am, and I'm not where you think I should be. At least I'm not a couch potato. It's healthy to celebrate progress. 
like David when he became king. He didn't have, he didn't have kingship of the whole kingdom. He, he was only king over Judah and Hebron for about seven years. He says, I might not have the whole kingdom, but at least I'm a king or something. I'm not running for my life anymore. I'm not in the cave running from Saul anymore. At least I got a crown on my head. He got confidence as king, but he, because he could always go back to his time as a shepherd. In 2 Samuel chapter 17, David says to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep and a lion and a, well it wasn't a tiger, a lion and a bear came and carried off the sheep and I went after it, I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth and when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. I've killed both the lion and the bear. Surely I can take out this uncircumcised Philistine. If God can give me the lion, if God can give me the bear, then God can give me any giant in my life. You have to learn to stack successes on top of each other and build your confidence. It's healthy to celebrate progress. Because when you do, God will touch you a second time. Verse 25 says one more, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. His eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. What God starts in you, he's going to finish it in you. God will not leave you until he brings to fruition the thing he put inside you. When God gives you a dream, when God gives you a vision, your friends cannot bring it to pass. They can walk alongside you. But God is doing something in their life. God wants to blow both of you up together. So when things get tight, when you begin to fail, when you question if it's worth it or if you can do it, I ask you to consider the testimony of the hand of Jesus. I would ask the deaf man... And he would say, I'm under construction because he does all things well. I would ask the leper and the leper would say, I'm under construction because he had mercy on me. I would ask the bleeding woman and she would say, I'm under construction. He changed my name. She would grab the microphone in the testimony service and she would say, the fountain of my blood dried up when I touched the hem of his garment. I would ask the dead girl and the dead girl would say, I'm under construction because he makes all things new. God is able to do exactly what he said he would do. Don't give up on him because he doesn't give up on you. I stop by to tell you that is what friends are for. Yeah. Friends who will not define you by your challenges. They will not define you by your condition. They will not define you by your disqualifications. They know everything about you, but they don't treat you any differently. Friends who will remind you in the dark the things that God has spoken to you in the light. Things who will remind you that God will be patient with you, so you might as well be patient with yourself. It took me nine years to get my bachelor's degree. There were some people who already had their doctorates in 2006. And I said, the journey that I'm on, you're not on that journey. I told a church last week that I'm, in six weeks I'll finish my second and third master's degree. And somebody walked up to me and says, why haven't you done your PhD? I said, sister, I've gone from a college dropout to a college professor what God is doing in my life furthermore are you gonna pay for it <laughs> that's what real friends do that says if you can do one you can do two you can do three you can do anything you put your mind to I won't put you in difficult places I won't hurt you I will help you I will remind you to celebrate what God has already done in your life. He touched you once, he'll touch you again. As the song says, if he did it before, he will do it again. The same God right now, the same God back then. You need friends to remind you that you might not be what you want to be, 
But at least you're not what you used to be. He's not through with you yet. Years ago, there were two uh, high school wrestlers in Cleveland, um, D'Artagnan and Leroy. Uh, and you hear their names and you know they're black. And then they went to a high school, D'Artagnan and Leroy, and they were different in every way. D'Artagnan was about 190 pounds and Leroy was about 170. But the reason why they became best friends wasn't because they wrestled, wasn't because they was black, wasn't because they were from the city of Cleveland. It was because of their disabilities. D'Artagnan was born with what's called Leber's disease. I might be mispronouncing it, but he had a disease where his eyes had blindness. He had nearsightedness. He could only see the framework of people, the countenance of people, the silhouette of people who were five feet in front of him. Leroy had another issue, another physical challenge. He wasn't blind, but when he was nine years old, he was stuck on the train tracks and the train came and, and he hit him and he was amputated above his knees and they became best friends because they knew how to wrestle each other. Leroy was the only, he was 170 pounds. He was the only dude in the whole city who could wrestle D'Artagnan. And then they became, they became um, sparring partners in, on the wrestling team. And then they became study partners. You would see one walking with his and the other would be in his wheelchair. And then one day they got the great idea for one to get on top of the other. Leroy got on top of D'Artagnan. D'Artagnan couldn't see, but Leroy couldn't walk. And what one person couldn't do, the other one did. That's what a real friend is. Yeah. Somebody who comes together in your life. And check it out. You don't get together just based upon your strengths. You come together based on your weaknesses. You see, they didn't judge each other. They knew what it was like to be made fun of, and they could help each other. Where one couldn't walk, the other was his legs. Where the other person couldn't see, the other person was his eyes. That's the kind of friend I want to be. What about you? They both went off to college. And they both have graduated from particular programs and they're doing well in life because of a friend they made in high school. I want to be a friend like that. What about you? If that's the kind of friend you want to be, I invite you to stand to your feet. I'll pray a special prayer just for you. A friend who's connected to you. And because of their connection with you, they become better at who they are. You don't become codependent on them. They don't become your standard, but they inspire you to be better. You see, if the blind man only hung out with blind people, he would still be blind. But see, the people in your circle, they have to be better than you. They have to be more advanced than you. It gives you something to reach for, but all they can do is refer you to greatness. But only Jesus can make it happen inside of you. You see, the people I went to school with, some of them, they were judging me um, 20 years ago, but they're still doing the same thing they was doing 20 years ago. Some of us, one of my um, college classmates, it took him several years just to get into medical school. It took him 10 years to finish at Howard, but the brother is still a doctor. It doesn't matter how long it takes for God to bring your dream to fruition. But if you keep going and celebrate the things he's already done, you have confidence to go forward. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we, we got thousands of so-called friends. 
show up in our lives and they say, um, aren't you, didn't I see you on Twitter? Didn't I see you on Instagram? Didn't I see you on Facebook? I'm like, I, I don't know you. You, you inspired me with X, Y, and Z. I'm like, praise the Lord. The people connected to us, it serves a purpose. We're not the destination, we're a referral source. We're just beggars showing other beggars where the bread is. That's the kind of friends we need, and that's the kind of friends we want to be. We'll lead others to Jesus, plead on their behalf, and tell them to be patient with themselves while God is working on the issues in their life. There's somebody here under the sound of my voice. You need to cut some people off. They toxic. Not only do they not help you, they're like the people when, you, when your car runs out of gas. Not only would they not help you, but they get out and they run in the opposite direction. Negroes won't even help you push. You need to cut some people off. God, I ask that you give us the courage and confidence to do and be the people you've called us to be. If that's what you need in your life, just respond by saying amen. God bless you. God bless you.